Welcome to Community Connection Bible Study for Women. We are studying Timeless Treasures, a in-depth study of the book of Ephesians, called by some as a Grand Canyon of Scripture. I know you'll be excited as week by week you delve into these passages that tell us the wonderful blessings that we have in Christ. In fact, in the first chapter, the third verse, God says that He has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Christ is a pivotal term there that He, Jesus, is the key to unlocking the treasures that we possess in Him. So my prayer for you is that as you see all that God has for you in His love and mercy, that you will be a changed woman as you go through this amazing book learning how much He loves you. This would be a great time for you to pause and to worship our great Savior through music. I'll lend you for a little while, a child of mine, God said. It may be six or seven years or twenty-three, two or three, but will you, till I call him back, take care of him for me? I cannot promise he will stay since all from earth return, but there are lessons taught below I want this child to learn. I've looked wide world, the, this wide world over in search of teachers true, and from the throngs and crowds of life's lane, I have selected you. Now will you give him all your love, nor think the labor vain, nor hate me when I come to take this Lent child back again. I fancied that I heard them say, Dear Lord, they will be, thy will be done. For all the joys thy child shall bring, the risk of grief will run. We'll shelter them with tenderness, we'll love them while we may, and for the happiness we've known, forever grateful say. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, we just commit the study time to you. I thank you for the great things that have been going on at the table, the discussions already. And Lord, all of us, whether we're mothers or grandmothers, single or uh, special aunts, ch workers in, in the children's departments within our churches, Lord, we all in some way have contact with children. So Lord, may we hear this lesson strongly in our hearts. May we affect a culture that has lost its sense of care and discipline in the lives of children. Lord, may we be educated women as far as this parenting process is concerned so that we can affect a culture for the cause of Christ. And so, Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us this morning. Lord, would you open our hearts to hear this message no matter where we are in our life. May we find something that's applicable to each and every one of us today. We need you to speak to our hearts, Lord, and we are asking today that you visit us. In Jesus' name, amen. That is such a poignant poem, isn't it? It's just an amazing poem as we think about children, and it's such a needed thought process for parents, that the children that are in our lives, you know, are not ours forever. Whether it's um, them growing up and going away to college or getting married or whatever the situation is, they are not ours to keep. They are not, they are not our possessions. They are a Lent child. And that is so important for us to get a hold of, that they are loaned to us for a short time. And as again, as we talked about marriage relationship, some of us are feeling like, what in the world does this have to do with me? 
Maybe I don't have children. Uh, maybe my children are, are grown and gone. But it's the same concept as we talked about yesterday. There are a couple reasons why we need to be thinking about the parenting process. Number one, it's important, remember we talked last week, that it's important for us to read every single page. We need to know the Word of God as educated women. We need to know when your coworker uh, next to you at work is saying, you know, wh what do you think about, you know, spanking? Or what do you think about, you know, training a child? Or why are kids the way they are today? I went to the movies this past weekend, and I cannot believe what kids are like today. When we hear those kinds of concepts, it's so great for us to say, you know what, let me tell you what the Word of God has to say. So we need to know, all of us need to be educated in the Word of God. All of us, as I said in my prayer, have um, contact of some sort, with some sort of children, if not intimately, um, personally, intimately, through family, through friends. All of us interact with children in our lives. And for and I kind of alluded to this a minute ago, our society, children today are screaming for adults to understand their world. They, they, to know what is going on in their lives and to introduce them to the Lord, to help them cope with and process what's going on in this world. There's this, uh, a funny little story about a frog that fell into a kettle of water. And gradually, the water in the kettle was turned up. And it was such a gradual process that the frog didn't even really notice it too much. And as with every rise of the temperature, the, the frog kind of acclimated to the, the temperature rising. And suddenly, the temperature was so high that he boiled to death. And he didn't even know it was happening. You know, that's kind of what uh, some of these principles are in our culture. The family has gradually been changing in imperceptible ways for a couple of decades. And finally, today, some of the damage that's done is suddenly upon us, and we didn't even realize it was happening. Kind of like a frog in a kettle, boiling away. Do you remember, I think I've mentioned this in the past, but do you remember 17 years ago, there was a man by the name of Gary Hart that ran for president. Do you remember that he had his picture taken on a boat with a woman in a bikini who was not his wife? Could have been his sister for all we know, but the implication was it wasn't. But because of that inappropriate picture, he had to leave the presidential waste. Do you remember that? That was 17 years ago. We have come a long way since that, haven't we, in our culture today. You see, that's how it happens, and that's why it is so important that we understand what God has to say about the family, whether we have a family or not. It's mandatory that we know so that we can affect a culture that is raising an angry generation. You don't have to, you know, um, be around children very much out in the public world there to see that we are raising an angry culture, aren't we? Now, I don't want to be depressing or anything, but do you know that in the last few years, 260 children were killed in the public school? Isn't that amazing? 260 children in school where they go for learning and where they go to be trained and, you know, and, and help to be educated and all those things. One of those shootings, there was a quote on the headlines of a paper in the city where it happened, and it says, and the, the headlines were, an angry child. And then the subtitles underneath it said, something made him angry inside. Well, God has a lot to say about that. I don't want us to be alarmed as parents and grandparents, but we've got to get our heads out of the sand, don't we? We have got to be aware of what's going on uh, around our children, our grandchildren, and, and the beloved children in our lives. Realistically become aware of what is happening in the life of the 21st century child. And realize how needed this teaching is to train the next generation to be God-fearing. You know, we are sending out an army today to take the next generation. And we have to be aware that our children are someday, in a few years, sooner than later, are going to be taking leadership in this country. 
leadership in our churches, leadership in our, in our country. And so we need to be aware, not to induce guilt, but to be challenged to get into the lives of this army, don't we? We need to be aware, we need to get in their, in their lives. And those who have children still at home, you know what, it is never too late to affect the next generation. You might be saying, well, you know, my kids are about ready to go off to college, or, you know, they're already in high school and everything. How can, and my grandkids are almost out the door. What can I do? Well, isn't it wonderful to know that in God's economy, there's no such thing as too late. If, I, if we believe that there is such a thing as too late, there would no, not be a Sheridan House Family Ministries. Because we take in hundreds of children over the year, boy, boys and girls, middle school age, and if we thought that that was too old to affect, we would just close the doors. My husband, Bob, became a Christian, and his life turned around when he was in college. So there's no such thing as too late in the, the lives of children. But we need to also not expend. Those of you who have already sent your kids out the door, um, we perhaps with regret, we need to be careful that we don't expend energy on guilt and, you know, oh, I wish I had. Oh, if only I had. We need to get past that. And we have to be on our knees praying, praying, praying for those children that perhaps you wish that you had been a believer at the time your children were growing up in your homes and saying, oh, if only I had applied those, those principles in my home. Instead, pray and get involved in the lives of other needy kids. Get involved. Be somebody that changes the course of that generation uh, that is coming up, growing up, and it's about to take over our country in a few short years. Having said all this, we're going to get into the passage to see what God has to say about his perspective on, on interaction with children. Remember, we're talking about how to walk worthy of the calling. How do we, in our gratitude to the Lord for all that he has given us in his timeless treasures, what is our worthy calling considering the children in our lives? Having said all that, we are now, at number one on your outline, the right relationship for children, the right relationship for children, verses one through three. Listen to this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. Now, there are two reasons that there is this call for honor and obedience. Number A, because it is a natural law. It fits into a natural law. It makes sense naturally. Paul says, for this is right. You know, almost every civilization that we know of has, is, is built on this principle, Christian or not. It's natural. It is a natural phenomenon that respect and absence, uh, with respect and absence when they are absent from, wait a minute, Oops, I'm getting all mixed up here. When respect and obedience are absent, there we go, finally got it out. It leads to the degradation first of the family and then really the society, doesn't it? And so most societies, Christian or pagan alike, know that there's a natural goodness about children respecting their parents. But secondly, and more importantly, be on your outline, it's a divine law, not only a natural law, but a divine law. We are to give honor and obedience to our parents because it is in accord, not only because it's in accord with natural law, but one, because it is commanded by God. It's commanded by God. Children are to obey their parents. It's a commandment. As Christians, for us, we say no more. If God says it, then we do it, don't we? God has said, children, obey your parents. Uh, God says it, period. And just as children are to be obedient to their earthly father, so we are to be obedient to our heavenly father. Jesus said in John 15, 10, and I'm kind of paraphrasing this, but he said, if you love me, you will show me by obeying my commandments. And so we are to obey our father, and we're to be encouraging the children in our lives to be obeying their parents because it's natural and it's a divine law. And also, number two, there is a promise. Look at this verse, Ephesians 6, 3, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. Now, of course, let me say this quickly, there are times when children die early, 
regardless of whether they're obedient or not. But the general rule of life is that children who honor their parents live longer and better. Why? Several reasons. A, first of all, it keeps them, when they're obedient, it keeps them from harm's way. It keeps them from harm's way. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. You know, if a child is obedient and you say, honey, don't put your hand on that hot stove and they're disobedient, what happens? They have seared flesh. That's a terrible <laughs> picture, but um, less accidents and situations that could harm them will happen. Children who listen generally find themselves in less dangerous places. Think about your own life. Do you sometimes wonder how you survived? Do you ever, ever wonder that? You know, wow, you know, my parents told me this and I was so disobedient in that phase of my life. It's amazing that I'm here to tell the story. Have you ever felt that way? We, um, the more we obeyed our parents, the more we were safe, really, in our lives. Wouldn't some of the fixes we found ourselves be avoided, have been avoided, if we had followed our parents' admonitions? Don't you think? We would have avoided a lot of hurt and pain, which brings us to another reason children are to obey, uh, who obey, live longer and better. B, spared bad habits. They are spared bad ha habits. A child who is obedient will be spared bad habits and bad friends who tend to ruin and shorten their lives. I'm sure there's never been a parent who has said, honey, let me introduce you to the wonderful habit of smoking. It is a wonderful habit. You ought to try it. I don't think too many parents would say that. Do you? Parents whose children are obedient help them to, to obey and step away from bad um, experiences and bad habits that they could develop in their life. I'll never forget. Don't tell them I told you this story, but I'll never forget when Roby, my son, got his first speeding ticket when he was in high school. Here's the interesting thing. He had left his cell phone on in the car by mistake. And we heard every screeching sound as he and his friends careened over this little hill in Fort Lauderdale. And as he you know, came over this hill, and there was a police car sitting right at the bottom of the hill and caught him. And all of that was on his cell phone. We heard every bit of it. Can you believe it? Talk about caught in the act, boy. But you know what? How many speeding tickets would we have avoided in life if we had been obedient children? Isn't that the truth? The final reason for an obedient ch that a, an obedient child will prosper is see development of character, because such a child will be far more likely to develop healthy character traits, where a disobedient child is far more likely to. Um, develop harmful patterns. Listen to these verses. Proverbs, you don't have to look them up, but you might want to jot them down. Proverbs 4.10, listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord adds length to the life, to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. For the reasons that I just, those are some of the practical reasons why an obedient full of character, child, and really adult, will do better in life because of those, those reasons. Now, what is required of a child to obey? See, in the Lord. The verse goes on to say, um, in the Lord, to, to obey your parents in the Lord. Number one, how do we do that? Number one, by listening. The word in Greek, obedience, in Greek, literally means listen under. Isn't that interesting? Listen under. Obedience involves conscious listening. A child cannot obey unless he is consciously listening to what uh, the, the parent or adult in his life is saying. Have you ever said to a child or heard somebody say to a child, are you listening to me? <laughs> That's the idea here, to listen under, to listen under. In the Lord implies that children are to obey these things which are consistent with Christ in his word. It, much of this has to do with number two on your outline, a right attitude, a right attitude. Children are not to be like the child who was sent to the corner to sit down because they were misbehaving. And the child turned and said, I might be sitting on the inside, but I'm, I mean on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. 
<laughs> and so often, isn't our attitude that way? You know, when, we're, when we are supposed to be a certain way or act a certain way, we say, okay, we grit our chin, okay, I'm going to do this, but on the inside, I am standing up. I'm going to do whatever I please. We need to be listening. We've got to have the right attitude. Obedience comes from a heart with an attitude of love and respect and a desire to show honor and consideration to the parent, which brings us to what about adult children? Where does that leave us? How are we supposed to respond to um, our parents as we are adults? Are we to obey? Well, no, we're not. We outgrow the call to obey our parents, but we never outgrow the responsibility to honor them. Do you notice the progression? It says, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. And then the next thing is honor your parents. So there's a progression here. Because last week we established the hierarchy, obedience, and submission in the home, didn't we? It said, a man, in it, a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife. Remember, there's a reference back to that Genesis 2 passage. So the implication is, once we're married and once we're adults, we're not to obey mom and dad anymore. And I think sometimes as women, we have to remember that we're not supposed to necessarily obey mom. You're, you have to be here every Sunday for dinner. You know, those sorts of things. I don't want to step on any toes, but we need to be very careful of that. We are to honor them as best we can. That doesn't necessarily do everything mom and dad say. That was when we were children, isn't it? We need to be very careful of that. Even as we trade places with our parents and need to become parents to our parents sometimes, we should do it with respect and honor. We should do it with respect and honor. And sometimes that can be very difficult, can't it? If we have parents that are, are fighting that or, or are very strong-willed, and you know, we need to do it very respectfully, always honoring them. There's such an area of need in our lives as, um, for our parents today because they're living longer and longer. My parents are in their 80s. Some of you have parents in their 90s. They're living longer and longer. And so, you know, we need to get in our minds that this is passage is not only for children, it's for adult children as well. Are we neglectful? Are we respectful? Are we ignoring or are we patronizing? We need to be very careful of the attitude that we carry for our parents. The interesting thought is that obedience and honor is not possible without training. You know, the verse says children obey your parents. Well, children aren't going to know to obey their parents until unless mom and dad train them to obey them. So it's back on the parents uh, shoulders, isn't it? Children are not born with a propensity and a desire to obey anyone's mandate. And your first temper tantrum with a child told you that. They are not born, unless it's a very rare child, that says, hi, mom and dad, I'm your new child, and I'm two years old, and I am here to obey and honor you and every one of your wishes. Isn't life going to be grand? No, not at all. Children are born <laughs> with a self-will. They are born with the sin flesh, fleshly sin. And, um, and so they don't just, by nature fall under your authority. In fact, I saw a classic example of the need for parents to train their children how to obey them in Blockbuster a couple weeks ago. I, it was absolutely classic. I was in line behind this mom, young mom. She had to be uh, in her early 30s. And this adorable little girl, she must have been three or four, and she was behind her. And they got into line. It was a long line in Blockbuster as people were checking out their movies and everything. And you know how Blockbuster, they are just so cagey how they do this. As you're in line here to go up to pay for your movie, all along here is candy and goodies. Yes. Well, as soon as mom and little darling got to the goodies, the, the little daughter's eyes started getting real big. And she said, <laughs> she said, honey, you cannot have anything to eat because it's almost time for dinner. In fact, I do not want you to even touch the candy and the goodies. Because, and if you do, very clearly, she looked down in her face and said, and if you touch them, Mommy is not going to rent your movie for you. 
And so the little girl looked up at her mom and kind of smiled at her, and she went, <laughs> touch the candy. <laughs> and her mom said, honey, no, no, no. I, mommy said, don't touch the food. Don't touch the food. And um, I don't, we're not going to have any candy because we haven't had dinner yet. It's not good for your little tummy, and la, 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 and went on and on and on. And don't touch the candy, because if, if you touch the candy, mommy is not going to rent your movie. <laughs> I mean, I wish that I had had a book by Bob Barnes that says, who's in charge here, and handed it out to her. I just thought, oh. And she, again, said, honey, no, no, no. She takes her hand off the candy. Don't put your hand on the candy. Don't have candy. And I'm just like, oh. And um, so they finally get up to the line. And I had um, kind of been distracted for a few minutes. And um, sure enough, you know what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> she had in her little fist some candy that her mommy had said, OK, well, maybe just one. And they went and rented the movie. Now, whose fault was that that little child was such a brat? Mom! If you're not going to be consistent, then don't say it in the first place. Mom, if, you don't, if you're going to give in to your child and give him the candy and rent the movie on top of it all, then don't make the proclamation that you cannot have the candy because we're going to eat dinner in a few minutes and I'm not going to rent your movie. Wow, her fault that that little girl was not obeying your mother and father is unto the Lord. It's the responsibility is on, on us as adults to train that child. That's why the next verse is to the children. In the parents' it is the parents' responsibility to train the children. So number two, that brings us to number two on the outline, the right relationship for parents. Look at verse four. Fathers. Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's, and in the New King James Version, I love it, it says provoke or anger your children. Notice that there are two parts. There's a negative part and there's a positive part. Do not exaggerate and bring them up, a negative and a positive. So we're going to begin with the, the negative. A, how do we provoke how do we provoke our children to anger? How do we do it? Number one, first of all, we do it through fault finding. By constantly finding the areas that your child has failed in. Thinking that the way to train them to be obedient is to remind them what rotten little brats they are. That doesn't work. And I'm sure that mother was tearing her hair out by the time she left Blockbuster. She was probably thinking, I can't believe I have to live with this child. She is so unruly. <laughs> and, and, you know, and th th that's our tendency when a child is out of control is to, you know, just to blast them and say, you are so disrespectful. You never get what I say. You never do what I say. And that is fault finding. We need to be very, very careful of that. That is a performance-based uh, home. You are loved and appreciated when you're being good. We need to be very, very careful. That is not in God's plan. That will cause exasperation in our children's lives. The right thing, and that right thing that a child is doing is based on what mom and dad think or what mom thinks or dad thinks. We need to be very careful of fault finding. Number two, neglect. Neglect. When children, and here it is in our culture today, when children are too busy with their own agendas to be involved in the lives of their children, that will cause exasperation. That will cause anger in the heart of the children. Parents in this culture wouldn't dream of allowing their children to get on a bike without a helmet. They wouldn't dream of not taking their child to get their booster shots at the doctor's office. And yet so many are so overwhelmed with their own lives and their own agendas that too many children in our culture are unprotected in their emotions and spirits too busy, neglected children. Parents are subcontracting sub out the training of their children to professionals. You know, I really don't know too much about this whole parenting process, so I am so glad they're going to Sunday school. I'm so glad that they're involved at church in the children's ministry. Thank goodness there are professionals there that can train them 
and their soccer coaches. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. And teachers, wow, I mean, they know what they're doing. They're trained. So I'm going to send my child to all these subcontractors and let them do the process. We need to be very, very careful of that. You know, Tori, my daughter, had works with the, the middle school uh, children at Sheridan House, and she had a single mom come to her, and she said, you have got to talk to my child. She is totally out of control. I really need your help. And as Tori talked to her, it became very apparent that the little girl was desperately trying to get her mom's attention. Her mom was very busy trying to keep her life together as a single mom and, you know, on the job and all the responsibilities, and she was just overwhelmed with all that. And the misbehaving child was misbehaving to get mom's attention. It was as simple as that. She just wanted mom to sit down, even if it were 10 minutes, and just look at her eyeball to eyeball and say, how has your day been today? How was school today? Even if the child says, fine, what did you do today? Nothing. Doesn't matter. That mom, keep plugging on, give attention. Uh, when we neglect our children, they, that will provoke them to anger. And perhaps the most worldwide, universal way to provoke children is number three on your outline, inconsistency. Inconsistency. That's what that mom in Blockbuster was dealing with. She said, now, if this happens, this is going to be the consequence. But she didn't stick to it, did she? She was, she, did not, she was not consistent. When parents have no plan for discipline and training, they're going to be in trouble because children are wired for boundaries. Children are wired for instruction. And when they have no consistent rules, and when the consequences are up for grabs and, and nobody sticks with the consequences, it makes children feel insecure and, and exasperated, angry even. They don't know why most of the time, but it makes them angry when there's not a consistency. When mom says, if you touch the candy, we will not rent the movie. That would be the consequence. And when the child touched the candy, say, honey, I am so sorry you chose to disobey mommy. Give me your hand. Let's leave Blockbuster. Simple as that. Inconsistency. And I know that's hard when those little, ooh, little faces look up at you, but oh my goodness. You know, for their sakes, let's love them enough to do the hard thing sometimes. Consistency. I will never forget, before my children were born, I, I taught school for Broward County Schools. And um, one day, and I taught first and second combination class of first and second graders. And one day, they were just acting horribly. And so I said, you know, kids, it's almost time for, for recess. And you all have been so unruly today and just, you know, weren't quiet when I told you to be quiet. It's just not been a good morning. So we're going to stay in for recess today. And I said, and it is because. Mrs. Barnes cares about you, and I want you to grow up to be great, you know, adults where you <laughs> respond to authority. And so because you have misbehaved today and did not follow what Mrs. Barnes said about being quiet and getting your job done, getting your lessons done, we are not going to recess. And they're all very quiet. And this one little first grade girl, just adorable little, ooh, so cute and perfect and all that kind of thing, and she raised her hand. She said, you know what, Mrs. Barnes, my mommy doesn't love me. She lets me do anything I want. I will never forget it. They know. It is down there somewhere because they need boundaries. They want boundaries. They feel secure when they're boundaries. When there is no plan for training, when there is no consistency regarding the plan, the result is anger. This passage continues then to talk about how to have a plan. The positive part, which I love, be on your outline. It says the balance of nurture and admonition. I love the way uh, the second part of 6 says in the, in the King James Version, but, this is a contrast verse, part of the verse, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Notice there is a balance between nurture and admonition. A balance of nurture, which is love, and admonition, which is structure. Now, you've all seen children that aren't balanced in this. The children that have 
all nurture. You know, mom just pours her life into their child and does everything the little child wants, and there's no admonition, there's no training, there's no um, structure. What happens is you have a child that is self-centered, difficult to be around, everything is all about them, they have no concept of other people, and they're just almost impossible to be with. Have you been around kids like that? Absolutely. In fact, I'll never forget my pa uh, a pastor I heard one time said, be sure to discipline your children so others can love them. Isn't that a wise statement? Discipline your children so others can love them. Children that get all nurture and no structure, no discipline, are out of control. Life is all about me. Now, the other side of the coin of, of the balance is in a home where it, there is great structure and great rules and great discipline but no, no nurture, what do you have? You have little robots that they can't move unless they have gotten a nod from mom or dad. And then, okay, and they, they can do what, what they're supposed to do. An, another example of that is a child that has no confidence in themselves. You see, God meant for there to be a balance of nurture and structure, a balance of nurture and discipline. A child needs to have a plan for training and then a plan to feel love. There needs to be a plan in place to train a child for adulthood, and there needs to be a plan that will allow a child to grow in a loving, nurturing environment within the boundaries. Very, very important. Well, first of all, let's take a look at nurture. What is nur nurture, number one, on your outline? Nurture is relationship or gentleness. The word nurture literally means feeds and cares, tenderness, and care. I have a, a friend who is um, of oriental descent. And when she turned five years old, on her fifth birthday, her father called her to himself and said, Honey, today you are five years old, and now you are grown up, so there will be no more hugging, no more kissing, no more sitting on daddy or mommy's lap. You are now a big girl. Isn't that a heartbreak? Children are desperate for nurture and love, for gentleness, for caring. Um, you know, I think even as they get older, they need it even more, especially in adolescence when they're gangly and weird and they're trying to figure themselves out and what's happening to my body here. I think in those times when they tend to be a little bit standoffish on the outside, they're desperate for that love, that nurture, that tenderness, that, that um, embracing of the child. But the second part of nurture, the second part of the equation, the balance, is training. Number two, what is training? Training is A, discipline, and B, instruction. Discipline and instruction. A great way to remember that is um, Bob has something that he calls the ICE plan. I-C-E, ICE. I stands for instruction, C stands for consequence, and E stands for exercise. Now let me give you an example. When Roby was in second grade, he was continually forgetting to bring his spelling book home. This is part of instruction and training. This is an example, and this is just a, a real easy example, but this is, can be applied in every area of a child's life. He was continually forgetting his spelling book. So Bob said to him one night, this is I, instructions, Roby, you must bring home your spelling book every Monday night because that's what your, your teachers told you to do. And because we've got to spend the rest of the week going over those spelling book words, and Friday you have a spelling test. And so the instruction is you will bring home your spelling book every Monday night. Not only Monday night, but Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. For those four days, you are expected to bring your spelling book home. I, instruction. C, now honey, if you forget to bring your spelling book home 
any one of Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday, here is what's going to happen. Here's the consequence. You will have to write the next day, when you do remember to bring your spelling book home, you will write your spelling words 10 times each. If you forget it on Tuesday night as well, then Wednesday night, you'll be writing them 20 times each. Now, tomorrow is Monday, honey. This is E, exercise. Don't forget to bring your spelling book home. Because if you do, you're going to be writing your words. I, instruction, C, consequence, E, exercise. So, well, how many times do you think Roby forgot his, his thing? <laughs> Well, the first night, of course, that first Monday night, he is sitting at the table, and your heart is breaking, because here's this little seven-year-old, he's, <laughs> he's writing 10 times 20 words, or however many it was on the list, and your heart breaks, and you want to say, oh, forget it, I, I didn't really mean it, honey, and go ahead and touch the candy, it's okay, I'm going to rent the movie for you, and um, your heart breaks for them. And so finally, the next day, he got it, and he brought, you know, his, his um, spelling book home, and we cheered for him. Oh, that is so great. Roby, we're so proud of you. Wednesday. <laughs> he had a soccer game. Oops is right. Forgot his book. Now, here is where consistency comes in. If we had said, well, honey, you know, you did do it Tuesday night, so let's forget it, and you, you know, we'll give you, we'll let, let you off the hook. No. Consistency boundaries, rules, lovingly, nurture and admonition. We are so sorry you forgot your book on Wednesday night. I am so sorry. Guess what that means, Roby? What is the consequence? Write the word 10 times. You know what? After that, it happened a couple of times. He didn't forget his spelling book ever again because he got sick of writing his spelling words so many times. But guess what? He became quite a speller by the end of his... <laughs> in fact, one night, Bob pulled in the driveway, and um, he said, uh, Roby, um, did you remember your spelling book? And he goes, oh, Dad, I forgot my spelling book. And he turned around and started to walk back into the kitchen, and there tucked in his belt was his spelling book. And so then we had fun. We could, we could laugh. And, and as he was writing his spelling words, we could sit at the table with him and, you know, give him a snack. And, okay, you've only got five more times for that fifth word. And you know what I mean? There, there we can put, we can, as long as the boundaries are in place, ice, instruction, consequence, exercise, then we can be all over the child. And, oh, my goodness, when they remember to bring their spelling book home all four nights of the week, we go for ice cream. We cheer. And they're very embarrassed, but they love it anyway. Let me tell you why we're here getting ice cream, Mr. Baskin-Robbins person. Do you know that this boy brought his spelling book home four times in a row? And the ice cream man's going, oh, great. That's really good news. <laughs> but, you know, and they're real embarrassed. But what an opportunity to nurture and admonish, balance. Children need that that balance, because here's the thing, when a child grows up with that kind of training, it prepares them for adulthood. You know, there are not too many bosses that say, I told you 10 times to get that report on my desk. They expect it the first time they say it. And the whole spelling and writing spelling words is not about spelling words and writing spelling words and remembering your book. The, the point of it is, to train a child to be a responsible adult someday. Nurture and admonition. There is, needs to be a balance, and children are wired to need that. When there's a balance, then we can have fun with, the ch with children. Then we can, you know, um, get so involved in their lives as long as we're staying within those boundaries. Three, summarizing the treasures we possess. Notice that the verse ends, of the Lord, of the Lord. You know, this is the Lord's training plan. This isn't ours. God wired us to need nurture and structure, nurture and admonition, nurture and discipline. He wired us. This is his plan. And that's why when we're operating in it, in the family, that's why it works well. That's why we can enjoy each other. That's when we can let loose and have fun as a family 
when there is that balance, because it's God's plan. He made us the way we made us. He's got the owner's manual in the glove compartment of the car. It's his plan. He knows how to operate this machine. In fact, isn't it interesting how so often he uses this technique in our own lives? Instruction, consequences, exercise. Instruction, right here. That's why we're talking about some of these very practical things like family and marriage. And next week, we're, or next two weeks from now, we're going to be talking about uh, relationships in the workplace. And everything is right here. Our instruction manual is right here. Consequences? Well, the Word of God says the result of sin is what? Death. There is a consequence. But here's the amazing thing about that loving parent. He then takes our consequence. When we disobey the instructions, he takes the consequence. And sometimes uh, when we get off track, he allows circumstances to come in our life that really train us and hone us and help us to understand what some of those principles are that are in here. Exercise, and then he gives us the re free will to live our lives the way we choose. And we're the ones that are blessed when we live in the nurture and the admonition of the Father. True? Absolutely. Not only is it a training of the Lord, I think it's also, I think that verse also means about the Lord, for the Lord. Listen to uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. You know this, 7, you know this verse, these verses very well. Number, verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Serve the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And here it is. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the, the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. There is no position that you're in that that verse doesn't cover. In other words, in every aspect of your life, train them in your children. Impress them in the lives of your children. Ultimately, that is our greatest responsibility in instruction, our greatest responsibility. Let's impact the next generation of children in the most important way that they can be impacted. Teach them about the Lord your God. Talk to them about it. When you're lying down, when you're walking, when you're sitting, when you're driving them to the school, in every position that you're in with your children or the children that are uh, in your spheres of influence, train them, teach them about the Lord your God. There's an army preparing to take over. It's called the next generation. And we want to be a part of training that army to do it for the cause of Christ. That's our responsibility. If the next generation comes up and we're old ladies sitting in a, in a retirement center and we're saying to each other, I cannot believe this next generation of kids. What happened? Oh, my goodness. They're not leaders at all. You know whose fault it is? Our fault. Our fault. Nurture and admonition. Train them to uh, know about the Lord your God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that in the, these very, very important areas of our lives that you don't set us adrift without instruction. Lord, help us to be consistent in our homes. Help us not to anger the children that are in, in our lives. Lord, may we, um, may we love them with balance, with nurture, and with structure, with discipline. May they see through our example and through our teaching who you are. May we be quick to instruct our children and our grandchildren and our, our beloved uh, nieces and nephews about who you are through our example and through the things that we have personally learned about you. So, Lord, we commit this next army that is preparing to take over our country, our churches, in leadership. May we be doing our part to train them to be soldiers of the Lord. We thank you for loving us. We thank you that you use the ice plan in our lives. And Lord, that, that the ultimate consequence in our lives was death. 
and yet you sent your son in your love for us to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven. Thank you that you give us opportunities to exercise the truths that are in your word in our lives so that we can learn what a loving and caring, amazing father you are. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.